633. You're classified as a first offender. The offense was aggravated incest or sexual battery. You're sentenced to 530 2006. You're sentenced to 20 years, 10 run concurrent. Your parole date is 320 2012 with a good time not eligible full term of 320 2022. On the panel today is Miss Pearl Wise, also Mr. Victor Jones. My name is Jim Wise, and I'll be chairing today. We'll be asking you some questions and then give your guest a, a time to speak on your behalf. At this time, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and start off with uh, Ms. Pearl Wise. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, do you remember, when was your last, is this your first parole hearing? No, ma'am. Uh, okay. My last one was in 2011, October of 2011. Okay, October 2011. Okay. Uh, have you taken the uh, and passed all of the sex offender treatment classes? I began it. I took the first uh, beginning first year of it. But then we ended up losing the person that was doing the class and we continue to have difficulties keeping people in there. And um, I was offered it a couple of times, but I was uh, involved in something else. And, and I had a hard time with it the first time. Like I, I don't do well with a group environment um, when, it, when it came to the, you know, the group discussions and things like that. I just, my, my emotions would get would override everything and, and my blood pressure would go up. And so, but I did try to take it. And then when the flood happened, it was no longer offered. And a lot of times the problem was they couldn't keep social workers there long enough to hold on to the job long enough for us to take the whole thing. So sometimes it would be three years. Sometimes they'd say it was a year or so. Um, okay, all right, I got your answer. So the answer is no, you have not completed the sex offender treatment program. Thank you, yeah. thank you, ma'am. Now, call out for the record, how much time you've served? Uh, almost 19 years. Almost 19 years. And your full term date uh, is showing May, I'm sorry, March 20th of 2022, I believe. That's your full yeah. term date, okay. Um, you uh, have completed cage your age, 100 hours of pre-release, and you got your GED. I'm just gonna call it out, put this on the record. And you uh, have completed upholstery trade. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So tell me about that uh, upholstery trade. What are you going to do with that? I love it. I love the being able to take something apart and refurbish it and make it beautiful. I love the sewing. I just love the the creating of it. And and just I have a very creative knack. I like to sew. I like to make things. I I, I, I I would say so because your face really light up when you start talking about upholstery. That's yes. good. I, I'm glad you found something that you like. Uh, uh, that's that's very important. Uh, now there was a there was some indication that in the file that I was reading that you were on drugs. Tell me about that. In my younger years, uh, I was dealing with a lot of. My husband was murdered. I kind of lost myself for a while and uh, yes, I did get on drugs and I became kind of promiscuous and I was doing things that I should not have done. Um, but I really didn't, I wasn't an addict because I don't, I don't even think about drugs now. Bad drugs are, I think it was more just the lifestyle and the people I was around Okay. I wasn't okay. faced like that. Okay. Was, okay, I got I, I get it. Okay, I get it. Uh you uh so tell me what where do you stand right now as to mental health? What kind of support do you need or are you receiving? I would really like to have a one on one psychologist or psychiatrist, someone I could open up to and um i know that i need a lot of help uh, mm -hmm. 
with everything that's happened. And yes. I need support. I need someone there that's going to be there for me. I don't, I do know I need that. Okay, so uh, but right now in the prison, uh, the records show you've had, uh, I think, 14 write-ups in, in 19 years. So, yes, and you have a low tiger school. So that tells me that you are adjusting well. So, so what do you what are you getting now in the prison that uh, that's got you doing as well as you're doing? Oh, as far as medication. Well, uh, just whatever you're doing for is your mental health to keep you. To where you you know they're not having to put you in lockdown you know like i said you seem to be adjusting well and taking programs I, I take my medication on a regular basis when i am required to see the psychiatrist i go and i talk to her um uh i just i do a lot of hobby craft i make i sew and i make things and that keeps me in a uh calm um, okay so uh okay okay so you're taking your medic you're complying with your medication and you see the uh the psychiatrist when, uh, whenever you can uh i did notice that um uh, you uh you were listed as a widow so tell me when did your when did your husband uh die what year was that do you in uh 1996 1996 okay all right and all this happened I'm trying to get back to my dates of when all this happened. Okay, he so he he was murdered. You said in 1996. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. Short before I came here to Louisiana, he was murdered in Illinois. Okay, okay. So you did leave the area, so that sometimes that helps. Yes. So you uh, and this offense date here was 2001. So. So it is, was your, your husband the father of all four of your children? He was the father to my first two. Your first two, okay. So were you uh, were the children getting the social security? No. They no. said he didn't have enough work. Uh, oh, okay, okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear that, okay. Oh, all right. Well, I'll... I'll uh, they said we were not eligible because he didn't have enough work credit. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's all right. It's just, like I said, I'm, I know that I, I probably still need some counseling for that, you know, because I've never really had, never been able to really deal with it in prison. Yes. Deal with the, I just dealt with it on my own. And yes. And, and did the kids get any kind of grief counseling? No, that's okay. one of the that's biggest good. mistakes I made. I should have got Quincy counseling. Mm -hmm. So you 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 had two children for your uh your husband and and who's the father of the other two children? The man that I was with here, uh, okay. Rex Scott. So is so what was y'all? What's the nature of y'all relationship now? What's y'all status? So I do not know. I don't even know if he's alive or dead. Uh, so were y'all married? No, ma'am. Okay, no, as I was, uh, again, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to figure out how you listed this widow. So you guys were together and y'all had two children together, but yes. you guys were never legally married. No. Gotcha, okay, gotcha. Okay, so if you are successful today, tell me what your plans are. Oh, well, I'm working with Ms. Durio on finding a, I would like to go to a transitional house so that I can get help I've never really lived on my own or um, had any kind of a successful life experience out there. So uh, I've been in the system since I was 14. So um, I would like to go into transitional housing and find some place that will help me and help me get on my feet, help me learn to be a, uh, you know, work in society. Uh, independent person, yes, ma'am. Right, independent person. Okay. Um, I want to work, work with dog. I, I had a I was in the dog training program at LCIW, and I became a certified dog handler. And I did that for four years, and I loved it. I loved it, and I would really like to work with veterans because I feel like that's a way for me to give back to my community, give back to my society, and back to the country. 
And I just feel that, you know, I have a, a heart for that. I have a heart for veterans and um, I would like to help them train dogs to be like uh, therapy dogs or okay. helpmates. Um, also, if I can and try to get involved in some kind of, um, I'd like to work with boats, motorcycles, cars, and, and like do the upholstery and in that type of oh, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to do that. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've seen some of those with people with their school stuff on them that I have seen some really nice stuff. Okay. Tell me the ages of your four children, just the range, the oldest and the youngest. My oldest is 25 now, and my youngest is 19. Okay, all right. So are, are they on their own? Do you know? My two youngest were adopted uh, okay. before I, I gave birth to my last one in St. Tammany. And he, okay. him and his little brother were adopted out to a family, somebody in, I don't know, uh, Good. So I have not, I've not seen them or heard from them since they were very little. And my two oldest are uh, in Iowa now. They, okay. as soon as they left the system, they went up there to the north. Okay, okay. Do you, do you have any contact with them at all? Yes, I have had contact with both of them. They actually went up north to try to contact me and they didn't know I was still in prison. <laughs> And when they found out I was still in prison, they contacted me. Okay, okay. But they contacted my family first. Good, yeah, okay. All right, okay. Uh, so do, do you know that your son is in the Department of Corrections in Iowa? Yes, I know that. Okay, all right, but well, that's all I had, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, Mr. Victor Jones, Ms. How you, uh, Ms. Christina? I'm gonna call, just call you Christina. All right. How are you this morning? Good. I'm good. How good. are you? Uh, so, for various reasons, you weren't able to finish the uh, sex offender phases, right? You just uh, did you complete the first one, first yes. phase? Yes, I did. I so did. You still need to do. Do you do you think uh, those did it help you in it? Or? What yeah, it mean? did. It 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 was all right. Okay. I think it was more the happening to go in a, a group and listen to their stories, and they wanted to talk about. It was very hard for me to talk about personal past things that had happened to me or that I had gone through. Uh, I would get very upset. My blood pressure would go up. I I have health problems, and so. Uh, but I did try and, um, yeah, it, it really helped me. I think that if I can get some one that I could maybe work with one-on-one -on -one or, you know, even if I have to take the group session, as long as I can just take so it you, and. I think there's uh, five phases of that sex offender. Yes. And you only completed the first one, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you say you've been in the system since 14. So I, you were in the system as a juvenile? Yes, sir. Okay. What, um, I think Ms. Wise covered all the questions that I had. Um, tell you what, at this time, let me, um, I don't have any more questions. Ms. Wise pretty well covered everything that I planned to ask you and about uh, hope you continue to do well. And uh, I think you need to get in those other phases, do, do the other phases as quick as you can. Um, I know with this COVID stuff, it got a lot of things uh, on hold and everything, but hopefully you can uh, get those other plans if I really think that you need them. Thank you. That's all. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Chairman. I I agree with Ms. Wise and also Mr. Jones. They they are real important that on all four phases of your sex offender treatment, you need to have it completed. 
And I don't know what you got to do to do it, but you have got to complete those phases there. I've looked at it every way I could, and, but they're real important. At this time, I see your grandmother's here. She wants to speak on your behalf. Uh, Miss Judy, if you would, unmute your mic. She's having the same problem I have, Jim. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm okay, Miss Judy. Okay. Well, I don't have a lot to say except that I know that Chris had a lot of um, problems growing up. She didn't have a good family support. Um, her her mother was married three times. Um, the kids basically left home when they were very young. And uh, they just, they didn't have the family support that they needed there. And also, I wanted to say that uh, Quincy actually told me that his mom did not do that to him. So that's, that's just about all I can say. I, I just want, I'm so proud of her for what she's accomplished when she's in there because none of her sisters got, none of them finished school. And so I'm really proud of the accomplishments she's had when she's in there. And I, I wish I could help her more, but I'm 81 years old and I don't have the ability to do that. So I just um, hope and pray that she can get out soon and make a good life for herself. Thank you very much. At this time, if the warden is there, would anything you'd like to say on her behalf, warden? Well, it's already been stated that the uh, that the treatment that is offered here, that at some point uh, she needs to complete it, whether it be here or on the outside. So that's been stated. Oh, thank you very much. At this time, uh, Christine, anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Um. As far as the treatment goes, they have not, they do not have it here. They have not currently had it since the flood. They, oh. mm. I will take it on the outside. I'll be, I'm more than willing. That's another reason why I would wanted to uh, be placed in the transitional house so that I could finish what I needed to finish my education wise and as far as that counseling goes and um, whatever else I, I need to learn. Hopefully get a, a psychiatrist, somebody that I can see on a regular basis. I have to interject something here. We currently do have sex offender treatment at LCIW. It's here. Oh, oh great, great, thank you. Okay. Yes, I understand. I understand that you know as long as as long as you've been there uh these sex offender programs are very very important especially yes, when I, a case like you have here uh any other question before we vote no no sir at this time the board will be voting uh we'll be starting on miss pearl wise all right young uh miss christina um I am just, you've served 19 of, of 20 years uh, and your good time date, uh, I, I, you know, you, it, it won't be long. It, it, you know, you, you almost, you, you're at the end. Uh, I'm going to take a chance on you. My vote is to grant uh, because of your good program, because of your trade, because of your mother's, uh, your, your, your grandmother's support today. After you complete the sex offender, program all phases yes ma'am and, and then and and then we're gonna it's gonna allow them the opportunity to get you in transitional housing uh that's gonna be a challenge um and you're gonna be under sex offender mandates in louisiana and and that's gonna be a challenge 
so you need to you know, start getting with your family about trying to save the money for your registration and all that kind of stuff. But I'm taking a chance on you. You've done well. You only had four, 14 write-ups in 19 years. And, uh, and then you've, you've done over 80% of your sentence. So my vote is to grant. And we have a low title. Thank you. At, at this time, I'll be voting. And, I, and one of the things I have a problem, as long as you've been incarcerated, you should have taken those phases. There's something that you don't wait 20 years you know when you're down, you need to be taking those programs. Today, I'm voting to deny because of uh, you need uh, four phases of that plus law enforcement opposition. Mr. Jones? Ms. Christina, I, I concur with Ms. Wise. Uh, you need those other phases. I'm disappointed you have not completed those. On the file, look somewhere that you had refused those classes. It's listed in the file that you refused them. Uh, was there a reason? Was it something that you couldn't deal with? Or is there a reason you didn't think you needed those uh, phases, uh, different classes? Or? Well, like I said, I, I I just didn't feel like I could, I could handle it. Uh, the group section sessions uh, that's bothered you or you wouldn't even talk about I'm sure you'd have to talk about it and admit your past and look like that has been a struggle for you. Um, at some, at, I know your son Quincy says he denied it later, but at some point uh, he said it did happen. Is that something that you're not able to deal with, uh, Christina? You hadn't come to reality and you hadn't, uh, you know, until you deal with that, I don't know. Uh, it's gonna be difficult, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna concur with Ms. Wise and uh, under the condition that you complete those uh, other phases in sex offender. All right, okay, thank you. At this time, the board is voted and you've been denied uh, because of uh, failed to comply with the programs, complete the programs, also law enforcement opposition. Thank you very much. All I have to say is thank goodness that we don't have to deal with this panel with this board this is the this is my nightmare you know it, it makes us we have to really count our lucky stars that that we don't have jim wise victor jones and miss pearl wise as our board of paroles you know people ask me they say what what do you think it is that that makes louisiana it's so intriguing and and you know it's it's not just the cases, but it's the board members. It's Miss Jackson. It's Mr. Roche. It's Mr. Marabella. You know, if you had other characters on the board that literally don't seem to want to be there, that don't seem to care. Do you know that her son was three years old when she did that to him? Three. It's not a typo. Three years old. There you go. Three. She was 22. Let's keep in mind, this is the time, the one time that she was caught. Did you hear the words that she said in the questioning? That was the little softball questions by this panel. She says, 
I was I was doing lots of drugs and it made me very promiscuous. What? Per, what are you talking about? What? You're you're serving a 22 year sentence for oral incest, aggravated incest on your three year old son. And then she says that one of the biggest mistakes that she has made was not putting her children through counseling when their father passed away. That's one of your biggest mistakes, really? Then her enabling mother comes on and actually says that he, she never even did it. I'm, we know. We know how Louisiana is. You don't get 22 years for something like that. Unless there is so much proof and so much worse and so much more evidence. She could have gotten house arrest. We've seen that. A couple years. Here and there, right? No, believe me, this was bad. This was more than just her three-year-old son. Just my opinion. I don't have facts. There's no information because it's just a child. So why would there be, right? But you actually have to say, wow, the DA did a better job than we've seen them do in a in, in, uh, uh, hundred other cases we've seen. And her enabling mother comes on and says that. And the board doesn't even flinch an eye. They don't bat an eye. They even almost buy into it. I know that she said that he... That he, you didn't do it. Oh, okay, yeah. That you know what that kid's been through since he's been three years old. You know what type of? Are you kidding me? Imagine how that grandmother has treated her grandchild. Cockroaches. You know what might make you feel better. What might make you feel better? I know that statistically it doesn't make any sense because according to her tiger, it's low. But she's been rearrested already. You know, believe me, you me, she didn't go and complete her sex offender treatment and get out earlier than she was supposed to. We, I believe we can all land on that. Uh, assumption with high confidence that she had to serve her full sentence. I bet you she did. But I have a mugshot here. And yeah, she was rearrested in Iowa, which is where she's from. And she, I believe it was on a uh, the, the, the date's not clear, but I think it was on 1-10-2023. So it would have been just a few months after she got released if she would have done her full-time date. Because this hearing's November 4th, 2020. Her full-term date was 2022. And, and would have been November of 2022. And then this is January. And I'm not sharing the screen with you because... Um, if there are certain information in it, uh, it would violate YouTube's um, policies. And so I, I can't do that for this particular link. Um, so I don't know if I don't think, you know, because she's not on any uh, parole, like she's not on um, any type of parole oversight. She's done her full term date. They're not going to like extradite her for a parole revocation hearing. She's just violated in Iowa. So I don't know what that would mean for her, a new charge or something. But I mean, it's not surprising. She doesn't fit under the exact category of, of, a, of a cockroach because she does have 14 write-ups, which I know it doesn't sound like a lot for 22 years, but 
for cockroach it isn't that is 14 more than you see mostly you know usually they have none it's it's quite incredible how they can pull that off and you know listening to her talk like the, just the complete there's they held they 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 held her to zero accountability she didn't have to admit her guilt she didn't have to say anything that she learned they let her just get away with her saying oh yeah i, I couldn't take a program i couldn't take it because i get anxiety my blood pressure goes up the idea that she was parole eligible in 2012 i mean she'll be like one of the first that we see that complete their full sentence and it's like she didn't even she knew she had to complete all the programs and then she has the the audacity the complete craziness in front of the warden to say that they don't have the programs there and the board doesn't even reprimand her for it they're just like oh okay yeah yeah this was oh i'm sorry your kids aren't aren't getting social social security oh i'm sorry that's terrible what did we just watch this was her three-year-old son in which everyone here is just like reinforcing the denial that her grandmother brought to the, to the Zoom call. And that's sick. That's why, that is why it is so important for an assistant district attorney to show up. We have seen some special district, assistant district attorneys that show up when they know that the that the perpetrator is not going to get out and they and they say why they're doing it they're doing it on behalf of the victim or victims and in this case that would have been it they'd be doing it on behalf of her, her three-year-old son at the time to say no he didn't make it up No, he's not going to get victimized again and again and again. No, we're going to set the record straight for grandma. This is a perfect case of why it's so important for them to show up. This is why we do this. This is why. But on that note, I just pulled up a hearing where the ADA does show up. And thank you, Richard, for providing this. I haven't seen it yet, but I thought it would be interesting to see maybe the contrast between the ADA showing up and the ADA not showing up. With that, let's go. DOC number 108141. Third class offender, parole eligibility date 618 2014, mid-time date 2 1 2097, full term date 5 30 2100, 106 years uh prison. You are uh aggravated aggravated crime against nature, <clears throat> aggravated sexual battery, armed robbery, habitual offender. Assessed on 10 30, 1984, revoked in 4 3, 1995. Uh, 15 years hard labor each count concurrent. 100 years hard labor at the DOC. Parole date 618. Uh, and, and you got your parole date and you got your, uh, uh, your good time. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. All right, would you please answer, Mr. Marabella? Good morning, Mr. Johnson. My name is Tony Marabella. How are you? All right. I've, I've got a, a number of questions uh, for you uh, today. Uh, your crimes are obviously uh, violent related. Uh, tell me about your anger. What have you done uh, while you've been in prison to control your anger? I took, <clears throat> I took anger management. I, I took the class anger management and I just, no, I'm not, I don't get angry that much. All right, well, let me let me ask you a couple of questions. You were denied parole back in August of 2017. Is that right? You came before yes, the parole board? I'm sorry? Yes, sir. 
Part of the reason that you were denied parole is because you had some disciplinary write-ups. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, since then, you've had three more disciplinary write-ups for defiance and aggravated disobedience. You're looking like you're surprised. That isn't true? Yeah, but <clears throat> I had them three write-ups. Uh, the lady wrote me up who, on them three write-ups. Cause I wouldn't, you know, cooperate with her wrongdoing, and she wrote me up on them three write-ups. So who wrote you up? A sergeant named McGee. Sergeant so McGee. The sergeant wanted you to do something wrong. You wouldn't do it, and that's why you're telling me you got wrote up on three different occasions. No, one write-up on the same. All three of them the same day, same time. One of them occurred on May the 2nd of 2018. One occurred on June 24th of 2018. And the other one occurred on July the 8th of 2018. Those are three different days. I ain't get, I ain't get no write up. One write up since I've been off the, went on the parole board. And that by Sergeant McGee. Well, I've got a record. Is your DOC number 108141? Yes, sir. On 5 2 of 2018, you had a write up. Your hearing date was May the 7th of 2018. Uh, on June 24th of 2018, you had a write up for aggravated disobedience. Your hearing date was on 6 26 of 2018. And on July 8th of 2018, you had a write up for defiance and aggravated disobedience and your hearing was on July the 1st of 2018. You're telling me that's all wrong? I don't remember the write-up. You don't remember all of that? No, sir. I remember the last write-up I had was in 17 when I come off the last board. Okay. Warden, can you clarify that for us, Warden? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm looking at the offender's disciplinary conduct report and uh, that, that is true. He, he did have the three write-ups uh, in 2018. All right, thank you, Ward. That's all the questions I have. Mr. Jones? Yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Johnson. You, you said that this officer wanted you to do something wrong. What was that wrong he was trying to get you to do? Well, she tried to get me to do a Wrong, doing wrong with the institution. I wouldn't agree, so she wrote me up on three write up. What was he trying to get you to do? Say that again. It was a female. She tried to get me to do wrong, and I wouldn't do it. What wrong was she trying to get you to do? Huh? What wrong was she trying to get you to do? She was trying to get me the whole contraband. I wrote the LP on and everything about it. She went to write me up. I'm the only one I remember the write up. She wanted you to hold contraband? Yes, yes, sir. What was that contraband? Cigarette stuff like that. Therefore, I wouldn't hold it. She Take what? Cigarette. She cigarette. Got, oh, cigarette for it, and I wouldn't hold it. So and when I got the free right to, uh, to bring the contraband into the jail? Yeah, she wanted me to hold it at work. I was working for her. And that's when she wrote me up on them three write-ups. I'm the only three I can remember. I don't remember the 18. The only one last write-up I got was from McGee. I don't remember the other one. Did did you report? Did you report that wrong? Did you report that wrong? I wrote the LP on it and everything. And what happened to that? Well, I went to uh, I went to court. They let me out the dungeon. Found me all, uh, give me the loss of canteen and let me out the dungeon. So what happened to the officer? What happened she to the officer? No, she no longer work here. For that reason. I couldn't really say what the reason was. I don't know. Okay. I have no other questions. All right, Warden, you have any other input for us? No, sir. I sure don't. Thank you. All right. We'll hear from uh, Ms. Burke now. Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Burke. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Melvin. I know that after 27 years, he have learned his lesson. If he is granted a second chance deep in my heart, I know he'll do right. I speak with him frequently. So I know his mindset has changed from what it was 27 years ago. And we have called the warden plenty of times on that officer McGee, but we don't know what was the outcome of it. 
So I don't know if the right if the write ups was the accurate ones or what, but we have called down there several times to the warden for the McGee person. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you, Ms. Krieger. Good morning, Adele Krieger with the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office. I'm here in opposition today based on the violent nature of the crimes in the instant case. Uh, Mr. Johnson was also, he's got a prior uh, revocation when he was granted parole before. Um, so he was given a second chance and then he committed the crime of armed robbery after being given that chance. So. Um, his track record to my office doesn't show that he would necessarily do well with supervision, especially with the um, continued write-ups, but um, I can't speak to the authenticity of, of those because um, I don't have those reports. Um, so for those reasons, my office is going to be uh, opposing today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Krieger. All right, Mr. Johnson, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? On my behalf? Yeah, on your behalf. No, would you like to make a statement of why you think you should be uh, granted parole? I think I should be granted parole because I am a changed person. I try to do everything right. And I like to be out there with my grandkids. They're young. I would like to be out there to try to raise them. And I can promise you I won't get in no trouble. I can promise you that. If I get a second chance, I, I, this is my second chance right here. When I was on parole the first time, I paid every month, went to my parole off every month and get in no trouble till I got this own robbery charge. When I did went to jail, it was charged that it was putting on me and they let me out. It's my first time in Angola and you know, my second time, but I, if I get a second chance, I won't come back no more. All right, thank you. Is the panel prepared to vote? Yes. Mr. Tony Marabella. Mr. Johnson, uh, you don't seem to remember the write-ups. Uh, you, you blame the, the, the uh, jailer for trying to do something wrong to you, but I'm looking at three write-ups here where you were given either reprimands, suspensions, or something. Uh, the warden indicates that those are accurate. That's exactly what happened. Now, you do remember one of them, but you don't remember three separate ones on three separate days. Uh, you do have a poor history of supervision. Uh, you have a history of violence. Uh, you have opposition from uh, law enforcement as well. For those reasons, I'm going to deny your parole today. Mr. Jones? Uh, my vote today would be to to deny also for the same reason Mr. Marvella has stated. All right, you have two votes to deny your parole. Also, I'm going to uh, vote to deny your parole. Uh, due to law enforcement opposition, you have uh, multiple DBs, 135, uh, poor institutional record, poor supervision record. I think you need more programming. Maybe you continue to work hard and maybe it'll be different this next time around. But right now, you have three votes to deny. Your parole's been denied. Thanks. I, uh, I'm just kind of speechless. I, I, I don't really, it's not really clear to me what he's done, except that he's done, done a lot. Richard has in the notes here that he, that the victim was a child or, or mentally or physically challenged person, but we don't have those details. I just know that it, I don't know if I misheard it, but did he have a 106 year sentence? Um, It's the initial crime was in 84, but he was revoked in 95. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I just don't. But And then this is a new th I mean, the, the guard wanting him to hold the contraband. And hey, you know, nothing would surprise me. I frankly wouldn't be surprised if that was the truth. But at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's completely made up. What was interesting enough was the DA didn't, the DA just like, we don't know about the write-ups, we won't comment. So it's like, I mean, it's possible. It wouldn't surprise, I don't think, anyone if this guard was really uh, making him a little contraband. Now, that wouldn't surprise me, but you're in a lose-lose because no one's going to believe you. Uh, you know, the assistant DA showed up. 
she didn't really bring any color onto it, or I don't think, you know, really spoke on behalf of the victim, so to speak. Maybe what I was, what we've seen in other cases, what I've had in mind, what I would have liked, I guess, to showcase. But he was, uh, he was denied, and I'm just sorry I, I can't add more information to to this hearing. But I do think maybe there's one thing we can look at is there's just a very big difference. And we see people come up for parole and you can tell they threw their lives. Uh, you know, he's in Angola and we see people who are in Angola that have just thrown their lives to rehabilitation and they have a very different kind of interview. They have few write-ups. They have tons of programs. They have support. They have uh and if anything, I think it can help us appreciate what those what those inmates have done and done and accomplished versus just taking it for granted because probably a lot don't. So let's see if we can do another hearing. And six. Is first that... class first class offender. Uh parole eligibility date two eight twenty twenty three. Good time. You don't have a good time. Full term date is Two nine twenty twenty six, uh, twenty 20 year sentence for aggravated incest. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to have a parole interview. We're going to ask you some questions and you can respond. At the end, you can make a statement. We'll take a vote. Do you understand the process? Yes, sir. And we have uh, who will be speaking We uh, with Mr. Phil Atkins. Mr. Phil will be uh, Tranquil James, Michelle Peterson, and Eddie Gibbs. They'll speak at the appropriate time. All right, would you answer Ms. Jackson's question, please? Uh, good morning, Mr. Relford. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. How old are you, Mr. Relford? 62. 62. And how long have you been incarcerated on this charge? I've been mean, uh, 16, 16 years and about eight, month, eight months. All right. Uh, so you've got uh, about three, three and a half years remaining on your sentence. Uh, so uh, how long have you been at the facility that you're currently uh, housed at? So is that Ellen? Uh, I came to Ellen about 2008. Okay, so you've been there a while. Yes, ma'am. Uh, tell us a little bit about what happened uh, in your case. Well, I just made a mistake, you know. With, 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 tell, me, uh, tell, me, tell me what mistake you made. Be taking advantage of her and, and did what I did. What I, what, I, what I did was wrong. Why would you do that? Explain to us, because you were in your 30s. Yes, ma'am. And she was what, like, started when she was very young. Uh, so explain to us. And you were in a relationship with her mom? Were you married to her mom? Yes, ma'am. So why would you do that? Why uh, would you do that? It's just a bad, it's a bad, it's a bad choice I made. Oh, but Mr. Bell, but a lot of people make bad choices. So, so yeah. let's not minimize it and call it a bad choice. But most people's bad choice don't involve uh, having sexual intercourse and impregnating a, a young girl who is the mother, I mean, who, whose mother you're in a relationship with. I need to understand why you think you did this. What is it about you that made you do this, you know, to this, this young girl? I don't know. Well, I think maybe I was, I was drinking and just, this this. Made a bad choice. I was drinking. Like I said, I was drinking. It's made, made a bad choice. Well, but again, a lot of people drink. They don't relax. Well, that's what happens. Well, that's what happens. Well, I mean, you know, I did you take the sex offender treatment program? Yes, ma'am. Tell me what you learned from those programs. I, I, I learned that uh, to, to what I what I did was wrong and to help other people and you know, all. Well, go ahead and apologize for what I mean, apologize to what, what I have done. And I left my mother in a bad situation with uh 
five, four kids to raise, you know. I thought, thought about all of it, all, all, all that came, came, came to play. How do you think what you did has affected the victim in this case? She ended up having to have the pregnancy terminated uh, because of the circumstances of what you did to her. And even though the DNA on the fetal material came back indicating that you were the one responsible, you continued to deny your, um, your guilt. So how do you think all of that impacted that young lady who had to go through all of this through no fault of her own? How do you think that impacted her? It impacted a lot, you know, like I said, like I said, uh, I was really wrong what I've done. And... I understand. I want you to think through how do you think what you did to her impacted her? Very little. It hurt her. That's it, she did her feelings. Her, I mean, what do you mean it hurt her? Yeah. How about, how about destroyed her? How about if we use the word destroyed her? Well, I, I, I said that I, I just I messed the life up for at the time I did. I take responsibility, take responsibility. I did, I did that. Let me ask you this: you and you and uh, the victim's mother have children together. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How many? We have four. Uh, and then um, the victim was not your child, she was your stepchild, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So uh, what I understand is that you have continued to tell your children, who happens to be uh, the victim's siblings, have siblings, you continue to insist to them that you didn't do this, that you didn't do anything wrong. Why have you done that? I didn't, I didn't tell them that. You, you've, never, you've never told your children that this wasn't true, you didn't I, do? I told my kids that I made some bad choices and, uh, and uh, I apologized to them, you know, and told them that uh, I was sorry for what I've done, being out there life and whatnot, you know, whatever. But I didn't tell them, I didn't, I didn't do it. I told them that when I told them, I said, uh, I'm sorry for the choice I made for not being there. I talked to my daughter Cameron, and she tell me that she tell me that. But uh, she told me that uh, to me was that was going on with her life. She had uh, two other kids and whatever, and I and I told her that I wish her wish her good luck with her marriage and going on with her life. But I don't know where that came from. Well, <clears throat> what what sort of What's the greatest lesson you've learned since being incarcerated, Mr. Rose? Well, I, I, you know, I thought the law call would, would come to your mind, and uh, you don't have to entertain that thought, you know? And I learned that, uh, you know, I examined, I examined that thought, what came to mind. I, I don't have to, I mean, I, like 17 years, I didn't drink, smoke, or nothing like that. And I made my, you know, I made myself a better man than I was before. I know that I'm better than I was before. I know, that I, I know down now that I can make to make the right choices. Uh, it looks like you haven't had any disciplinary write-ups. Is that correct? Right. And how long have you been incarcerated on this charge? Uh, like uh, got on uh, seventeen years. Um, so, I mean, that's an outstanding disciplinary record. What's your job at the prison? Well, I'm a dorm owner right now. I just got that. I, I was a tip walker not long ago. I, now I'm a dorm owner now. Okay. Um, and you have done... Um, I'm looking at the programs you've taken. Uh, you have done... Um, all four phases of sex offender treatment. And I see you've also done uh, some uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in 2014 and 2015. Uh, why did you stop participating in uh, AA meetings? Well, uh, well, when I started doing that, I started having some classes 
I was starting all like like uh thank you for a not thank you for a change to Puku and uh step up start that facilitating classes, giving back what I what was uh was given to me. You know, helping out helping out the inmates, you know, with big uh, classes and stuff like that. That's why. So you, have you taken thinking for a change? Yes, ma'am. Just, just, just got to finish that in September. In September. All right. Where'd you get out of that? I, I always think that, no, like I say, I think I think about it before uh, in the choices I make. I think about what, what uh, the questions of it. No. I know that um, the sex offender uh, treatment program picked up the question but have you taken the separate uh, victim awareness program? Yes, ma'am. Okay, when did you take that? I took it a while back, not, not long ago, about a year ago. I think about a year, year or two. Um, so what program do you think has had the biggest impact on changing you as a person? Well, Tabuka was, was a good one. Had a, had, a, had a good. Uh, tell us about. I, I'm not familiar with that. So tell us what that program is about and it's what you're about. It's like thinking for a change. You know, you think about what you do before you you do it. You, you do it, and when that when that thought comes to your mind, you you examine it, and you don't have to react upon it. You know, you think about it. You think you know you think about it for years for years act upon it like that. Mm -hmm. So, if you were successful today, what would be your transition plan? Where would you live? Where would you work? What's your plan as far as being uh, involved in uh, the lives of your biological children? Well, I'll put it out my, my sister. She stayed by herself. And, uh, she Where did your sister live? She she's in the street board. She uh she pretty much raised me. And she she like seventy one years old and she, that's who's been supportive of me since I've been incarcerated. Uh, my children uh they they already they talking about coming back into my life and uh you know I'm gonna apologize to them once again when I get home and tell them all the things that what I what all things I've done and I'm sorry for being out in their of their life. You know, I talked I talk to my daughter, Cameron, and uh, she told me, she said, uh, she said, Daddy, she said, uh, Emily kind of mad with you. I said, I'm mad with me, you know? And I said, and I, was, I go, she goes, well, she mad because, you know, you hadn't, you hadn't been there, Daddy. You didn't let me do a prom or, or whatever. And, you know, you know that kind of kind of broke me a little bit, but, you know, I learned from that. That made me strong, you know, made me strong. Where is the victim there? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. She knows she lives. Do you know she's still in Shreveport? Yeah, she, I don't know, ma'am. I don't know, ma'am. I don't know. All right. Um, Warren, can you what can you tell us about Mr. Relevant? Um, pretty much, Mr. Jackson, like you noted on, uh, this disciplinary record is pretty much exceptional. The dormitory unit we have to live at uh, is pretty much for offenders that actually have trustee status or well, uh, very, very good disciplinary records. Um, so uh, in the area where he's at, the working as a dorm mall and the staff down there say he actually does a good job. And that's pretty much it. All right, um, Mr. Council, uh, you that's all I have. All right, now we're here from uh, from the uh, from opposition, Mr. Trapel James. Can't hear you. Now we can. Good morning. Good morning. I am Tanequa James. I am the victim. Um, and this is, I, I, I kind of have a lot to say, so I'll just um, take my time with it. Um, trauma is defined as a deep distressing or disturbed experience. 
the aftermath of a traumatic experience never completely leaves you. If you're strong enough, you can overcome and learn how to manage. Sometimes the aftermath gets the best of you and consumes your life and brings about unforeseen circumstances that tear your life apart worse than what you've known it to be. I'm proud to say that I was strong enough to overcome, but for years I've dealt with the aftermath of the trauma that was inflicted upon me at the hands of one who was supposed to love me and whom I trusted, someone that I called my stepdad. <clears throat> His actions has interrupted my life as well as my family. I not, I not only speak for my mother, my father, my six siblings, in which he is the father for, I speak for my stepsister, his oldest daughter, and his sisters, even when they know not that they need to be spoken for, as well as his nieces and nephews. When I say he destroyed a family and caused trauma to a lot of them, even though they fail to realize it. <clears throat> for years, some of his family has fought to me, the child in this situation, because of the lie that he has perpetrated. Today, him and his family look forward to him being paroled and eventually coming home. But my pain still runs deep because he has no remorse. And for the first time today is the first time I've ever heard him admit guilt to what he has done. He's held on to the lie that I've lied on him for years. I'm not sure how one can be such a changed person when they fail to take accountability for their actions and the damage that it has caused so many people. His sentence may have been for 20 years, but his trauma and my thoughts are for a lifetime. And although it's me who has experienced this firsthand abuse, I now carry the burden of healing myself so that I can heal and help my family with the trauma that he has inflicted upon us. One person has caused so much heartache and trauma, and yet it's that one person who still has not grown in years to accept the responsibility of his actions and render a sincere apology. And to just add from the things that I've heard today, alcohol was never a factor. He's always been competent. At some point in time, he was a decent father. Um, so alcohol was never a problem. And again, in all of the years that this has went on, this is the first time that he's admitted any guilt for his actions. He does still continue to lie to his kids. Um, he just recently had a conversation last April with my brother, Lee Michael, which is the knee baby of the family. And Lee Michael asked him to be honest about what he has done. And he said and told Lee Michael that I lied on him because he caught me with the boy across the street. And so I don't know in a couple months time if um, he's taking responsibility for his guilt, but for the years that I've had to endure what I've endured, he's still held to the fact that he hasn't done anything wrong. So for me to hear him say that he made bad choices, it kind of had a plethora of emotions that flowed because I've never heard that before. Um, and so I would feel as if for one to be changed and for one to have this immaculate record and to be a new person, they would have to feel some sort of remorse for what it is that they've done. Um, and one can't stand to imagine what we've suffered as a family, as well as myself firsthand, when they haven't endured the pain that we've had to endure. Um, I have four siblings that are his kids, um, and the fact that one will not admit their actions to their children sometimes play a factor in the relationship that we have as, that we have as siblings. Um, and that's my take on this situation. Thank you guys for um, you. the opportunity to hear me. Thank you so much. Thank you for your coming. We have from Ms. Michelle Peterson, a brief statement. Ms. Peterson. Well, well good morning. Good morning. I am Michelle Peterson. Um, as my daughter got up here and said the most, that leaves me with not very much left to say, no more than, you know, um, this situation, me as the mom, um, has taken a toll on the kids as well as myself. And just to hear Mr. Relifer uh, admit to us face to face here that he's guilty of the charges that he's been committed of uh, is my first time hearing that as well. Um, 
I just have to say that, you know, this has been a traumatic decision that he made years ago. Uh, it has, again, affected the entire family. Um, and I don't know, after just listening to him, whether or not I can accept that he's changed. Um, maybe changed without remorse. I don't know what it is. But at this point, just listening to what he had to say, I don't see a man and or hear a man that feel like he just uh, learned the lesson from what he's done. And that's just my take on that right now. Because you just can't do a child in that manner and then do the years that you've done and then still sit after years later and not even apologize to her knowing that she's present today. You know, that should have been the first thing you should have been able to say to, to, uh, to us. You know, the apology would have meant a lot from my standpoint. And that's my brief statement on it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Eddie Gibbs. You can make a brief statement. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good morning. My name is Eddie Gibbs. I'm in uh, Tamika, Florida. As I sit up here and watch what he, the statement he said, First of all, I want to say, say alcohol had a problem, had a problem with that. I don't think alcohol had a problem with it because, you know, I know Mr. Ralph over the years, me and him talked several times when I come down to see my daughter. Since he sit up and lied about alcohol played a role, I don't think alcohol played a role. For myself, it hurt me from day one. You know, he messed us up, but. Thank God that I know a father that he gave us screen through all this. But I look at him as he spoke this morning. You know, yeah, you may be incarcerated, but I don't, deep down in my heart, I feel like he, he haven't changed. And I don't have too much to say right now, but I just pray that, you know, you get your life together. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank God. You. Hi, right, Mr. Relifer, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? No. All right, would you like to make a statement on your behalf, Mr. Relifer? Yeah, I was surprised at that, you know, but uh, like I said, I, 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 talk, I talked about it. I talked, I talked to the kids, my kids, and uh, I don't know where that came from, but uh, that's all I got to say. Okay, thank you. Panel prepared to vote? Yes. Ms. Jackson. Uh, Mr. Rowe, uh, let me just start by saying you, you've got a good prison record. You've done uh, most of your sentence. You have about three years or so uh, served, and you've done some good programming. Uh, but the thing when I first started reviewing your case, the thing that really troubled me was the fact that you allowed your children for a long time to believe that the victim had lied. She had made this up because of, you know, you told that to the police and they you know, took a DNA sample from the young man that you accused of being responsible for the pregnancy. They took your DNA and it came back to you, not to that young man. And yet you persisted on telling your children that uh, she just lied because you caught her with someone. Uh, and I don't think you really understand the trauma that you have caused in this young lady's life. I just don't think you, you, you understand that at this point. And also, just the, I mean, She's not as close to her sibling as she would desire to be. Their relationship isn't what it should be because you have been a wedge between them by your insistence over the years uh, that you didn't do this. And, and you further inflict the trauma on that uh, your own family, your own children, by leading them to believe that your sister lied on you. Uh, and even though you've taken some programs, um, Mr. Relevant, for me today, I just don't think you're ready. I think you need to really understand 
how what you did just destroyed a family. And it was just out of your, uh, you know, your own sexual need. It had nothing to do with alcohol. And so today, I, I cannot vote for you for that. I hope that you will continue to work on yourself, not just in the program. You can sit in the program, but you've got to get inside yourself and, and find out why you would see that child as a sexual object for your youth and why you couldn't be honest and admit to your family what you've done and then to understand how much harm you've done. So because of strong victim opposition in the case and uh, the fact that I just don't think that you uh, quite understand the severity of the crime, my vote today would be to deny your request for an early release. Mr. Freeman? Well, uh, I concur with Ms. Jackson. I don't think he's owning up to the situation. And I also vote to deny. She votes to deny your parole. Also, I'm going to vote to deny your parole today. Law enforcement proposition, victim opposition. Three votes to deny today. Your parole has been denied. Good luck to you. I'm going to just have a seat back out here. Right. I'm going to wait for the paperwork. So I have to apologize if, you, if we've seen this. We have seen this hearing already. I did it like seven or eight months ago. Uh, it all came back to me once I started watching it. <sighs> you know, all, all I can say is the survivors, mic drop, said it all. That was amazing. She had it written just beautifully and delivered so elegantly he was just stuck there in his seat staring the dead man walking he denied 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 until dna you still can't deny it but even with the dna he's still denying it Like Ms. Jackson said, he doesn't understand. He has no idea. It wasn't just her for his sexual gratification. He wrecked an entire family. And 20 year sentence. Which is just, to me, I don't understand how when you have DNA and you have a survivor that obviously is, well, I know it's a bunch of years later, but you had DNA at the time. You had DNA. Why would you make a deal? You're holding a royal flush. in your hands and you make a deal. My pain still runs deep. He has no remorse. His sentence might be for 20 years, but mine will last a lifetime. And that is, those are words that these DAs and judges just don't seem to get. Now, I wish I had more information to share on this, but I don't. It's... These cases, you just can't find anything on them. They don't make the news, or maybe they did, but can't find anything on the internet. He's still locked up, still the same place, Alan Correctional. 
E60 plus a few years old. And uh, what was it? No write ups? What a shocker. Yeah, I, I, I do want to rage on, on this, but I I think the survivor said it best. I think Miss Jackson said it best. I think the parole board voted. And he's just going to finish up the rest of his time. And he's probably going to get out and probably still repeat the same things. Now it's not true. Because it's just that's just the way it is. We can do one more hearing. Hang on. Now this case, thank you, Richard. It, it's it, it gets me nervous. He has there his attorney, who is Keith, uh, uh, is one of the top attorneys that we see representing. Uh, these inmates, and it always scares me because he wins a lot of his commutation hearings. And this is a commutation hearing. Now, the hearing went on for about two minutes before they lost the connection, and then they're coming back now using the warden's phone to film it. But the information that they discussed is that he was sentenced in 1982. So he's been locked up a long time and given, I believe, multiple life sentences for. just incredible multiple and roach like crimes uh, uh but we'll just jump into it Th those are the notes i have and we do have court information we'll go over after the hearing as well thank you richard again but with that let's jump in to, uh, Mr. Nordyke, we are back. We're still having some technical issues, but we are we are going to at least finish this year and using Warden Buttress's cell phone. So that's that's what you're seeing me. So, uh, Mr. Davis, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Roche. Warden Russ, can you hear us okay? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. All right, Mr. Roche. Mr. Davis, that's yes, good uh, Mr. Davis, at your victim and yourself on the bed in the bedroom. Did you instruct the victim to commit an unnatural act? Yes, sir. What were you doing at the time? He was performing his act on you. Um, not sure. I, I don't understand the question. The report, the report said that you were smoking a marijuana cigarette. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Are you agree with me or do you remember that? No, sir. I, I don't doubt anything that was in the record. Not one bit. It's just a lot of it I, I don't recall. I did know the time and, and, and over time it's probably not even as clear as it was then, but I, I have no reason to doubt anything that's in the record. Well, there are a lot of things that went on after this unnatural sex act and the smoking of the marijuana. Tell me exactly what was going on with Keith Bees that he molested a nine-year-old 
Thank you. I just I just need to know exactly what was going on. Oh, I obviously a very disturbed individual. Um, a lot of you know. I have no excuses. I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, hearing it from you all these years later, just, I, I don't, I, I, I can't, I, I, I don't know, nothing that I would say would, would sound like anything other than some type of excuse. And I don't excuse anything I did. I'm devastated by the fact that, you know, my victims and still suffering from it. I mean, I kind of figured that was true, but it's kind of hard to hear. The victim, um, the victim, William uh, Robinson, did submit a, a, a statement, uh, and he is still affected by this crime. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember? And, and this keyword, I want to know if you remember. Once you completed your offense, our offense is, did you actually threaten the young man by telling him you would kill him and his parents if he ever told anyone what happened at your house that day. Oh, I'm sure I did, yes, sir. So you go over part of the way back home, drop him off at a shopping center, and you walk the rest of the way home. Yes, sir. And possibly. Five days later, you were arrested and convicted of these crimes. Yes, sir. Let's talk about your alcohol and drug addiction. When did you, talk, you, when did you first start using marijuana? At what age? About 11. Yeah. Did you graduate to anything other than marijuana? Yes, sir. I mean, um, you know, at, at, at about 13 or 14, you know, I started doing uh, depressants. I like, you know, downers, pills and stuff. When did you first get involved with alcohol? Oh, at 10. I, I started experimenting with alcohol at 10. So you were using alcohol and drugs before the age of 13? Yes, sir. How often did you use uh, drugs and alcohol? Every chance I got. By the time I was uh, seven, 15 or 16, I was using every day. And how long did you use alcohol and drugs? Uh, until December 21st of 1990. But that was after you were incarcerated. Yes, sir. So tell me about the program that you're taking to assist you with your drug and alcohol addiction. And what did you get from those programs? Well, I started going to ANA in the, uh, I think it was late 80s, even though I was still using for a while. But it, I kept listening. That we had some outside volunteers that kept coming in, and uh, they seemed to really care about us, even though we were in prison. And after hearing it for a long time, I finally realized one day that if, that if I didn't stop using and, and, and try to do something, you know, other than just 
attending meetings and, and faking, trying to, to, to build a good jacket, that if I didn't do something that, that I was never going to be able to change. And I, and I didn't want to be this, the same way anymore. So I credit mainly ANA with that, helping me to finally get away, you know, from, from having to use. And, you know, I look back now and, and realize I haven't used in like 30 something years. And, and I can remember when I couldn't go 30 minutes. Uh, tell, tell the panel this afternoon about your sobriety plan. How do you plan to stay sober, drug free, if and when you release? I'd have to continue my meetings. I'd have to continue my program, the fellowship, men and women, share, share the experience, strength, and hope. And how about getting a good sponsor? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely necessary. So, Mr. D, you're going to be fighting two, actually three demons when, when you release alcohol, drugs, and you'll be a registered sex offender. Yes, sir. How do you plan to handle all of those demons? Well, sir, I figured that after what I put everybody else through, that 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 ought to, you know, that's something that, you know, that's what I deserve. You know, I, I, I you, you know, when you wake up every morning and you look in the mirror and you realize that when you think of the worst thing you can think of, and you've already done those things then the fear of doing something like that again or hurt somebody else like that again makes you want to fight to 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 not be that person and that was a long time ago and i certainly don't think there's enough time in the world that you could do that race something like that but the only way that i could you know pay any honor a recognition to, to my victim is just to ensure that I never hurt anybody else again. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is your disciplinary record. Yes, sir. You have a total of 20 disciplinary write ups in 40 years of incarceration. At first glance, it's not really bad. And only 20 write ups in 40 years. But when I look at your disciplinary record on June 21st, on June 21st, 2010, you got written up for 21C, an aggravated sex offense. On the 23rd of the same month, you went to disciplinary court and you were found guilty. You appealed that decision. And on July 21st, the original verdict was upheld in disciplinary court and you were sentenced to extended lockdown for a period of time. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So tell us what the 21C was for and how long did you stay in extended court? The, the report said that uh, an officer entered the room and he saw me sitting in a chair with another offender who had his, his genital pulled out and was standing next to me. Like he had interrupted us just prior, just after having sex. And I spent uh, about nine and a half months in extended lockdown. I was in extended lockdown well into 2011. Yes, sir. I think I got out in like March of 2011. Okay. 
Why did you appeal the decision of the disciplinary court? The reason I appealed is because I knew that having something like that on my record was going to come back to haunt me as a sex offender. And that day is here. Yes, sir. Mr. Dees, I want to thank you for your honesty this afternoon, your cooperation. You've not been evasive. You've not been uh, anything else but uh, agreeable and helpful in my presentation. I want to thank you for your honesty. Thank you, sir. Warren Russ, do you have any comments, remarks, or observations at this time? Yes, sir. Um, uh, Mr. Dees is a trustee here at the institution where he currently works at our SOAP plan for prison enterprises. Uh, we do have an assessment uh, from the supervisors there that have all commented that he has a positive work ethic, positive attitude, good conduct, and positive work performance. Um, as stated earlier, he does have a low tiger risk assessment. Um, we do show that he is backlog for uh, cage of rage and for nurturing parenting. Um, he's been here at Hunt since um, August of 2017. He has not been a security issue here or a disciplinary issue um, since being transferred to Hunt. You add some clauses to that list, uh, $100 free release, I uh, thank you for a change, which I think will be very important to this offender. Yes, sir. We um will definitely uh get him signed up for those uh um programming so he can get the other treatment that he needs. Thank you, Warren Russ. Madam Chairman, at this time, I do not. I repeat, I do not have a recommendation. I will continue to listen to the other board members in discussion with Mr. D. I will listen to its supporters. If there's any victims, I will listen to the victims' remarks by the legal community and his attorney, Mr. Nordyke. Hopefully after hearing the testimony, I can formulate my recommendation. But at this time, I have no idea what that recommendation will be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, at this time, we'll hear from the folks who are here speaking in support. Look, we'd like to start with Mr. Bill Crawford. I'm sorry, before we start with you, Mr. Crawford, I apologize, Ms. Jackson. Mrs. Jackson has a question of Mr. Deeds. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Deeds, I'd like to ask just a couple of questions of you. Uh, yes, today, have you come to terms with, with your sexual orientation? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. How do you view your sexual orientation? I'm homosexual. Okay, but how do you feel about being homosexual? Well, I feel a lot better about it today than I did 40 years ago when I didn't find it was acceptable in any kind of way. Okay. Why do you, why do you think you were attracted to children. And is that a whole different issue from being homosexual? Yes, it's not a crime to be homosexual, but it is a crime to have sexual contact, whether heterosexual or homosexual, with children. 
And so my question is, why do you think you've taken sex offender treatment, have you not? Yes, ma'am. And you've had a chance over the years to think about, uh, you know, what, what your inclinations are. Why do you think you were drawn to children? And what could assure us that that's not going to be an issue for you in the future? So, first, why do you think uh, your victims were children? Why you chose children? Okay. Um, I had some pretty uh, uh, enjoyable sexual experiences as a kid that were with other boys. And uh, around the time when I decided that uh, I couldn't be gay, that, that I started using drugs and alcohol. And of course, this is not a professional opinion or anything. It's just, it's before, you know, I, I took three different types of uh, sex offender treatment. I took one that was mainly psychological and, uh, and then the Madison County treatment uh, program, which is more behavioral. And the understanding that, that I think that I got is that part of it is that I kind of got stuck when I started using drugs and alcohol at that age. And, and when I tried to move forward and to be normal and to, to be with women and stuff, when it wasn't, when it, when it didn't work out, I would revert back to what I knew as, as being enjoyable, which is with the other children. I, think to a great degree I was scared of adults and when I came to prison I had no choice but to grow up and to deal with other adults and learn how to be an adult but the thing about the Madison County program that that really opened my eyes to, to sex offender treatment is that it was not just psychological you could understand all day long what you think why you do things but this Madison County program is behavioral and you can learn to if you don't put yourself in those situations where you don't have easy access to children you don't allow yourself to be without supervision that you can avoid those kind of things because that program teaches you that you're still going to be a sexual being but that you can choose appropriate relationships and i think that was something i don't think i understood way back you know 40 years ago do you, do you think that being comfortable with your sexual orientation will help you make those behavioral changes? Because it seems that you were trying to suppress those urges and instincts that you had. And my question is, do you think that you have achieved a level of, of acceptance or comfort? with your uh, sexual orientation or do you think because you keep you, you refer you keep using the word normal that you're not normal and so I'm trying to get a sense of how you actually feel about your sexual orientation is that something that you're comfortable with uh acknowledging and just acting on with adults as opposed to children. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when I was saying normal, I was trying to reflect what I felt then about what I thought normal was. And today, just speaking about this in front of all the wardens and stuff is a big step for me because I still don't discuss it with a lot of people. And I, you know, in here, yeah, I don't try to act on it because I want to. I want to go home. I want to be free. And um, I, I realized that, you know, these things are still against the rules, even if they wouldn't be illegal on the street. But the biggest thing that was a, a hold out, hold up for me is that I didn't think my family would accept it. And I realized now, you know, after my family has supported me with, you know, visit and loved me for 40 years, that they'll accept me, you know, even though. I felt like maybe I had disappointed them in some way. In fact, I know like my relationship with my dad is, is he's going to love me no matter what. And I have a stepdad now that, that loves me and 
and it's my best friend and my brother's my best friend. And those things meant a lot to me then. And now that I realize that, that they don't care about that, then it's, it's been a lot easier for me to accept. Oh, thank you very much, Ms. Steve. I appreciate your uh, opening. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Okay, Mr. Bill Crawford. You're still on mute. Okay, I'm off mute now. Um, I'm sitting here listening to these charges and it just amazes me. You look at the, the young man or the man that's sitting there now and how he acts and how he presents himself every day. It's like two different people. I just, it just can't, it's hard to imagine that he did all that stuff that he did back then. I'd like to go back though 40 years 50 years, you know, he was raised by a conservative family from Tanchico Parish. Uh, homosexuality was not even a consideration. I, I just, I, I try to imagine what his life was like trying to accept the situation that he was a homosexual and nobody in the world could know. But I found out later from his, from his brother and sister, everybody knew but he didn't think they did. Um, you know, it's not an excuse. I'm not excusing what he did, but just, can you imagine the, few, the confusion in his life trying to accept what he was? But again, that's my opinion and not a professional opinion. As far as today, uh, I'm his stepfather. I have a very good relationship with the Dees family. Uh, I was with his dad yesterday. We had a family function. We are all in support of him. Uh, if we can get him out, we will work very, very diligently to get him acclimated back into society. Uh, I know that's going to be hard. Uh, 40 years off the street, that's got to be tough. But he has particularly like in the job he has now, he deals with the public every day. He's, uh, he does purchasing, he arranges shipments. So he has some relationship with the outside world. So I think he could be, you know, he could be brought back in fairly easily. Um, uh, my plan is for him to move in with me and my wife and and we closely oversee what he does and where he goes and et cetera. Uh, I have offered him employment. I own a company called St. James Marine and we clean and repair barges on the Mississippi River down in Bashery. Our office is in Baton Rouge. Uh, I have basically retired and uh, my stepchildren are running my company now and I would bring Keith in an administrative position to, to work with them. Um, I would supply him with a, a home, a car, health insurance, so he can, you know. And then I have another home that's available. And if once he gets to the point where we all are comfortable with him, he, he, we would let him move into that house. Uh, on the selfish side, I'm 79 and my wife is 80. She has dementia. And it would be such a plus for us to have him out. Uh, if I happen to die first, he could take over and keep her out of a nursing home. If I get so I can't function, he could take care of both of us. So that's my selfish point on this. I'd just like to, in closing, just to, to ask you to just consider that what we saw today, the horrible stuff we saw today was 40 years ago. He's a totally different man today. And I think that he can perform very well in society if you give him the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. Sir, Mr. Paul, thank you. Mr. Kevin Beans. I'm, you're still on? 
Okay, I'm unmuted in here now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you know, I'm glad I was able to follow the entire meeting um, because, you know, I'm Keith's younger brother. Um, I shared a room with him our whole life growing up. I shared housing with him after we were both grown. Um, you know, in our late teens, early 20s, we rented a house together once. We rented an apartment together once. Um, you know, the record was read uh, uh, a few minutes ago that showed all of this trouble that he caused for himself and others, you know, in particular from the late 70s to the early 80s. I had a front row seat to all of it. Um, I know who he is. I know who he was. And uh, I've always, you know, stood up for him, even when it wasn't easy to, like when we lived together, I always thought, you know, once I didn't have to share a room with him, I, I wasn't going to be around him that much because it was difficult. Uh, um, but I found myself rooming with him on more than one occasion, and partly because trying to keep track of him and look out for him uh, to some degree, I was completely unsuccessful with that. Um, and, you know, there were trouble, like for me, and I'm glad it came up without it coming from us. But, you know, Keith had gay friends and other uh, gay men that were around that, that he knew, that we knew. And, and I always tried to promote to him, why don't you hang out with Brett and those guys? Why don't you spend time with those guys? Why don't you be yourself? You know, and all he ever did was kick back at that. He just, I'm not like them. They're nice guys, but I'm not the same as them. He just could not deal with what was, you know, readily apparent to me, at least, you know, um, you know, I remember going out of town and, um, you know, coming back home early because I forgot something and he had some guys over and they were barbecuing and playing records and, you know, and stuff like that and watching a movie and, and, you know, he made them all leave as soon as I got there, you know, and it was guys who were openly gay fellas and he just couldn't go there and it's too bad you know, because there's nothing wrong with those people. Um, that's just who they were. And he could never deal with that. Uh, another unprofessional opinion, um, you know, is that he started to me spending time, you know, like that kind of activity with people that that wouldn't be open about it, that he could get to maybe keep it a secret. OK, and that's what I think where all the problems came in with the charges, um, you know, dumping on to his inability to deal with who he was an amazing amount of alcohol and drugs that I witnessed. Um, you know, it's just, it was just chaos for a five or six or seven year period. And, and the trouble, you know, was actually started well before that, but, um, you know, once my brother went to prison, he didn't, you know, like immediately overnight become this different guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was several years that before he got clean there. But, you know, that had a specific impact on me. Um, I ended up having trouble with drugs myself. And by the time that things were getting out of hand for me in the mid-90s, my brother had several years clean and sober and he started um, talking to me about it and trying to help me. Our visits, which were frequent, became 12 step meetings. Um, he was my first sponsor and I ended up getting clean. I even ended up being invited as a sober speaker to a banquet that they had at the prison at Wade. Um, I've been, you know, thankful because I thought when he first got arrested and convicted that job one of the prison system was to separate him from the public, you know, to keep them safe. And that was happening. And then secondly, to punish him for his misdeeds. 
and that was going to happen. Um, but what I didn't realize was the number of programs available to him that he's availed himself of those programs and that not only, you know, has it affected him, it uh, saved me, you know, that his influence. Um, and, and then I've just been happy to see him um, do all these positive things because that was not who he was before he went to prison. Uh, he was confused. I mean, yeah. Would you, uh, can you, we have to move on, sir. Can you wrap it up for us? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to echo what my stepfather said is that um, the person that I've known, you know, the whole time, the person that he was when he was committing all those crimes is hardly recognizable in the man that I know now. Um, and I'm just glad that the help is available in the prison system that he's been able to make those kind of changes because it wasn't done on his own. It was done through all the programs and all the help that he's been able to get while he's been serving all this time. Yes, sir. We appreciate your comments. All right, we'll hear, uh, if Mr. Keith, please. We'd like to hear your statement if you have one before we turn it over to Mr. Nordyke. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say that, Mr. Brochet, I understand your concern that your responsibilities as the board has. I mean, everybody who comes in here puts their best foot forward. You have a very short period of time to make a determination. But regardless of what your decision is today, I want, you, I want to state for the record that saying I'm sorry, the reason I never wrote a, a victim's a letter to my victim is because I just felt like saying I'm sorry is is almost an insult because it doesn't go far enough to say how sorry I am that I've hurt people that have affected their lives and I've seen people in here who've been affected by abuse that I put on other people that I, I could see that they wound up where I am because the abuse they suffered and there's just not enough words in the English language to say how sorry I am and I certainly want to go home and be with my family especially my mother before she doesn't even know who I am anymore but whatever you decide I deserve I don't I don't want you to think that I think I deserve anything better than what I got but I'm not the same person that I was 40 years ago and I really appreciate the board for allowing me to to have this hearing today. Yes, sir, thank you. Mr. Nordyke. I think this is the only aggravated rape case I have ever taken in my career. And the reason I did is sitting in front of you today in the form of Keith Dees. Um, you know, we, we can't determine who we are when we're born. We can't determine how we're wired. We can't determine what our sexuality is going to be. And it's pretty clear to me that, that Keith Dees struggled with that from a very early age, and he drowned it with alcohol, he drowned it with drugs. And he finally, finally uh, got to prison after doing some awful things. Mr. Roche's uh, elucidation of that was, was very well done, and it covered, it covered his offense. But he gets to prison and several things happen. First of all, he continues to use for a while, but he's been sober for 32 years. For 32 years, he's been clean and sober. And I think that's probably the turning point for him. That's when he made the big, big change. He got involved in AA. The second thing that happened to him, which I have not spent as much time talking to him about, but it came out today, is the Madison County program. The, the behavioral part of the Madison County program clearly, clearly has clicked in for Keith Dees. The third thing is his age. He's age 63. He's, you know, to put it bluntly, he's past all this foolishness. And I think that, I think that were he given the chance under tight strictures, under family supervision, under 
the rules that he would have to follow on parole, I think he could make it and do it well. And to answer Mr. Roche's question, I don't think there's a lot of public risk with with this young this young man, this, this man uh, having those those things surrounding him. He's only had three write ups since 1980. Maybe he had 20 some odd before, but only three since 1980. And I think that's a pretty significant, a pretty significant turnaround for him. He's been backlogged for the courses that you're concerned about. And were the board to grant him relief today, he would have plenty of time before any parole hearing to accomplish those courses. So I, I would I would ask the board to commute his sentence, give this man a chance to live on the outside under some very tight conditions that the parole committee might set. And I'd be happy to answer any questions the board might have about this. Thank you. Questions? All right. I think we're prepared to vote, Mr. Rocha. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Before I vote, Floyd Russ? Yes, sir. Make sure that Mr. Deese is enrolled in those classes. Is that one again to be prepared? For the next uh, proceeding. Yes, sir. Mr. Naldite, this may have been your first aggravated rape, but I've read a lot of Keith Naldite's briefs. This was one of the better ones. The information was very helpful. Talking to you, Mr. Naldite. Mr. Deeds. Yes, sir. Based upon positive remarks for Ward Russ, the completion of your sex offender treatment and substance abuse treatment, an excellent transition plan with your stepfather, living with your mother, and working with his uh, company, St. James Marine. And most of all, your cooperation and your honesty today at this hearing. I'm going to recommend to my colleagues that we recommend to the governor the mutual sentence for nine nine years with low eligibility after serving forty years. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. How many years? How many years have you served thus far, Mr. Deese? It'll be forty years in September. Mr. Dees, uh, you know, on paper, your case was a very, very difficult one. It still is a very difficult one. Uh, yes. Thank your honesty and, and, and the honest answers that you gave today. Uh, we've all had an opportunity, at least I've had an opportunity, to see who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, I think you have a tremendous amount of family support. Uh, you have a family that understands you now, uh, uh, and I think you understand yourself now. I think that's the most critical thing. You've done some tremendous uh, work while you've been in prison. Uh, you've been a trustee. Uh, you, you have a low risk. You've overcome a lot, and you've gone through a lot. Uh, my vote today would likewise to be to uh, commute your sentence to 99 years and uh, grant, uh, recommend uh, parole eligibility after 40 years. I would strongly support Mr. Roche's uh, comments to you to take those classes that he mentioned before. Uh, assuming you get through today, uh, that uh, you do that before your next year. So good luck to you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Randall, uh, Mr. Freeman? Uh, Mr. Dees, you know, I, I look at your past criminal history. 
And those charges are hard, hard to bring to court with the children who are not involved. Yes, sir. I also feel like if they wouldn't have been come knock on bang on your door, we'd have had another offense here today. And I, I just cannot vote to grant. I vote to deny. Yes, sir. Mr. Craven, Ms. Jackson. All right. Uh, Dave, I appreciate you being open. I really do. I know that's difficult. And I'm glad that you would reach the point where you've accepted who you are and you can live with the reality of um, you know, or, or what your uh, sexual preference is. Uh, I think you've done well. I think the sex offender treatment program, you've taken that to heart and I think it's impacted you in a positive way. I think you have expressed genuine remorse and I think you have a good support uh, and transition uh, plan. And so my vote today would be to grant commutation of the sentence to 99 years with parole eligibility after 40 years. Thank you. All right, Mr. Dees. Um, I do appreciate you being open and honest with us today. Um, I think it, it went a long way with me because I, you know, reviewing the record, I just didn't feel like I'd feel like I do right now. Uh, but I believe it's because of your honesty and the way you work on it. Um, so my vote today also is to make the recommendation that your sentence be commuted to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. So you receive four favorable votes. Uh, so the recommendation will be that your sentence be commuted to 99 years with parole eligibility after having served for me. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't feel like I do now, Ms. Renanza says. That's because, in my opinion, you have all just been gaslit. Gaslit. All of you except for Mr. Freeman. If the police hadn't come a week after he committed the offense, there would have been more victims knocking on the door. I say no doubt. No, I don't think Mr. O'Shea did a good job of pointing out the travesty of this crime. And we were talking earlier, almost an hour and a half ago, about how important it is for a DA to show up because all we had was an unread letter by the victim. You know what happened in this case? On September 2nd, 1982, this cockroach told a little boy that he had a bicycle to give him. A bicycle. He took him into his house to give him this bicycle. After they got into the house, they discovered that the bicycle was broken. So he told the nine-year-old to go into his house so they can get a screwdriver to fix it. Once in the bedroom, this monster, this, oh, man who was just in the closet, he just didn't understand, right? Oh, like that's the biggest insult. How do you even say that? What are you talking about? Th that has nothing to do with children. When he has him in the bedroom, he pulls out a gun. He points it at this nine-year-old child. Then he struck him with it. He knocked him down. He made him undress. He made him get into bed with him. He made him perform oral. And then after that, he had intercourse. And it, when it was done, he said that he would off his mother. He would off his family if he told anyone. And God bless his little baby, this nine-year-old, that he won and he did tell them. 
And then you know what his appeal was? His appeal was is that the child lied on the stand. He went to court. He was denied. He was given a life sentence without parole plus 15 years to run concurrently without parole. And now, 40 years later, he gets a, a board to get all stuck up on the fact that somehow he was stuck in the closet. He was struggling with his with his sexuality. What? What are you talking about? Are we all mad? What does this have to do with anything? If my math is right, he was born in 1961. He would have been 20 years old when he did this. What does this have to do with him being homosexual? Nothing. How did the entire hearing come about that? Where everyone's saying, poor him. He was in the closet. It was in the 60s. No, in the 80s. He he he, he wasn't, so he, he was insecure. He didn't know what to do. He was nine years old. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. He, he literally manipulated the entire board. Why do you think you were attracted to children? He talks about how he had great experiences when he was younger, and that's what he, what are you, 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 you brought a nine-year-old boy into your home when you're a full, when you're a 20-year-old man, because you told him you give him a bicycle, then you take a weapon out, you strike him, you assault him, you threaten to wipe out his family, and that, and now your excuse 40 years later is, oh, oh, it's because you, 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 you were struggling with your, with your identity, and, and the board buys it hook, line, and sinker. And you know, I think it was it was Miss Jackson that brought it up to begin with. But I'm thinking hard, and because Mr. O'Shea ended the commutation hearing by saying to the attorney Keith, who said this was the very first case, so he has integrity where he won't take a case, but this one he will. And he writes, I'm guessing, I don't know for certain, but in the in the in the pre-commutation report, he'll write something that the board will see. And that's what Mr. O'Shea commented on. And I'm guessing that whatever he wrote planted the seed, which was the strategy, the chess game they had to are, what are we direction we gonna put? What are we gonna say the reason for why you did this? And he, and then that's where the whole hearing went. The whole hearing was under that direction. His 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 stepfather, his brother. That was all they were talking about, and it makes no sense. What? what why is there any relevancy? So it was a nine-year-old boy instead of a nine-year-old girl? Is that, like, what are you saying? What he needs to have said is that he identified that he was a full-blown pedo. That's what he should have said. He, he came to that realization. That he was a monster. That he is a monster. You you alter the life of a child for your for your sexual satisfaction. It 
it doesn't make sense. Even according to his own brother, he wasn't having a hard time making friends for the opposite. You know, he was doing fine. He was having friends hang over. Then his brother even does more uh, of, you know, um, what's the word? He 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 said that you know I think that that it was that he, he was struggling with his identity he was hiding it so then he started hanging out with people who weren't open about it and that and they had a bad influence on him. What? It, am I crazy? Am I am I nuts? Is this like? It, 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 it is what I'm saying so controversial that I'm going to get like, this is going to get taken off of YouTube and I'm going to get shut down because I'm not like, like what, what, what is going on? I don't know. I'm confused. Tell me I'm crazy. I've lost my mind. He's still locked up. The, the the governor needs to sign off on it. And I think if the, the governor, there's an election coming up. I just realized now I'm saying so many words um, that YouTube algorithm is probably like on this thing. Forget the monetization. It's not monetized, but I'm just saying like um, just all the other things that can happen. He's saying the word election, saying the word YouTube, saying the word homosexual, saying like... I don't know. The 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 governor hasn't signed the 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 commutation hearing. If he signs it, there will be a parole hearing. And we'll cover it. And I think if there is a parole, it will probably happen in the next few months. This, this hearing took place a little while ago, actually. So it's been a little while. Let's see the exact date of it. Um, it took place in 2022 of... Uh, May of 2022, so it's been a little more than a year, and we're seeing a lot of these commutation hearings uh, being signed up by the governor, but it could be the governor doesn't sign it. It could be the governor looks at this crime and says, why? Why would I sign this? He was a nine-year-old boy. Um, and it wasn't unanimous. And that always hurts. That always hurts. It can hurt the chances just a little bit. But we'll find out. Hey, you tell me. The the most important thing is that we're not an echo chamber on you on on the Mandu YouTube channel. We don't repeat what everyone says. We are respectful to everyone's opinions. And the important thing is to be respectful. Um, and so. I'll be reading the comments. And with that, I'll let you go.